it is 201 and I want to be respectful of people's time. So um, let's get this started. Uh, I'm Natalie Furlet. I am the director for membership and partner for partnership and member engagement with Campus Compact. Uh, thank you for being here for our national webinar series. Um, today we are talking about creating impact through global citizenship and education. Um, all of our attendees are we're in webinar mode, so if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A, and we will get to them when there's a designated question and answer period. But for right now, I'm going to just hand this over to our wonderful presenters. Um, so uh, we have two folks from Roger Williams University, and Mary, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today. We're so excited. Um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna pull up our slideshow in a moment. All right. So again, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mary Ellen Lynch. I'm an adjunct professor at uh, Roger Williams University, a uh, university college um, in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I'm joined by my former student and now colleague, um, Sam Mutiamani, um, who will be a co-presenter and later will be sharing a project that he completed in my Thriving in a Global World course um, to share how he incorporated uh, global citizenship components and sustainable development goals into his project and how he's now continuing this work um, in his classes at Roger Williams. Um, so good afternoon and we'll get started. Um, first, I wanted to go over our session agenda. Um, so first, um, I wanted to um, especially for those who uh, global citizenship education might be new to. Um, we'll start with just a definition of what that is, um, and then we'll move into how uh, we can use a project-based learning approach to facilitate global citizenship education. And then we'll get into some, um, we'll share some projects that I've facilitated with my students. And then Sen will share the project that he completed in my course as well. And then like Natalie said, um, at the end of our session, um, we'll have time to take questions, um, but please feel free to type your questions in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end. Okay. What I wanted to do first, uh, before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit more about myself. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm an adjunct professor at Roger Williams University, uh, University College. So I teach uh, community development, um, continuing ed courses. Um, so my background is international education. Um, so I teach community development through a global lens. Um, so I integrate you know, components of global citizenship education um, and use the sustainable development goals as a framework, and we'll get to that shortly, um, in my classes to really um, encourage students to explore uh, local issues in their global context. Um, what I found is, uh, my students and my students are of learners of all ages. Um, what I found is that they really respond to this type of curriculum for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one, many of them um, didn't have the opportunity to learn about global issues prior to my courses. Um, and I think what really excites me about um, using global citizenship frameworks is that it develops this urge to respond among students. Many of them, when they're exploring these local issues in a global context, they really get this urge to respond and want to take action. And that's where I find project-based learning to be a really effective approach in providing um, that space for students to really put their ideas into practice. So we'll get into that more later. But before we jump in, I just wanted to get a sense of um, how many of you are already facilitating global citizenship education. So I have a poll um, that I'll launch in a moment. So, so I'm gonna send out a poll. If you could just share um, you know, what your experience um, has been um, facilitating global citizenship education. Okay. All right. So I'll give you a few minutes to complete the poll. Give another moment. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Give another moment for people to respond. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share the results. All right, well, thank you for participating in the poll. It looks like 59% um, of participants, um, global citizenship education is new to them. And 35% of participants um, have um, done some facilitation with global citizenship education and 6% are pros, love it. <laughs> so a diverse range here. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share the results. For this. Okay, thank you. All right, so for some, this may not be new to you, but just wanted to start um, with defining global citizenship education. Um, so the United Nations um, defines global citizenship education as providing the understanding, skills, and values students need to cooperate in resolving the interconnected challenges of the 21st century, including climate change, conflict, poverty, hunger, and issues of equity and sustainability. Um, so um, next slide, please. Thanks. So. Um, asiasociety.org, and at the end of the presentation, I have some other resources for folks, but um, Asia Society built a national movement around, um, in the United States, around the concept of global citizenship um, called global competence. Um, and here they developed the four domains of global competence um, that articulates the knowledge, skills, and values um, known as 21st century skills. So there's many different frame, frameworks for global citizenship. Um, Oxfam um, has its own World Savvy, and I have those resources on, on our last slide, um, but wanted to share this one. Um, I use this one in, in Oxfam, Oxfam's uh, framework quite frequently, um, but I wanted to uh, present Asia Society's uh, four domains of global competence because in particular, I use this as a framework for my project-based learning. So for example, um, when I engage students in projects um, incorporating global citizenship components, um, they're able to investigate the world you know, beyond their immediate environment by exploring you know, local issues in a global context. Um, they're able to recognize diverse perspectives because I have them work in teams. So they learn from their peers. They learn from the community organizations that they're partnering with. Um, they enhance their communication skills um, by by being able to effectively um, you know, speak persuasively, articulate their ideas um, with diverse audiences. And then the last one at the end, the bottom of the slide is that take action part. And that's the, the taking action part, um, which is why we titled the presentation Creating Impact, um, because that's the part that I wanted to focus on the presentation on today in terms of um, really showing how project-based learning can provide um, that opportunity for students to put their ideas into practice. Next, thanks. So here are some key dimensions um, for a global citizenship education. And again, this may not be new to some of you who are already facilitating um, this type of curriculum, um, but the last one, so while I incorporate all these dimensions into the projects that I engage students in, um, again, the one I wanna focus on our conversation on today is the behavioral dimension and that action piece, um, because Again, the project-based learning is a great uh, way to um, engage students in projects, um, exploring you know, issue, global issues um, in a local context. Um, so the action piece I find to be really um, effective in um, providing students the opportunities to really put their ideas into practice in partnership with community organizations. Um, next slide. So now the sustainable development goals, um, 
for those who this might be new um, for you in 2015, United Nations World Leaders committed to 17 sustainable development goals um, to help in these three areas, ending extreme poverty, fighting inequality and injustice, and fixing climate change. Next slide. Here you see all of the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, the unique thing about the SDGs is that um, all of these goals um, intersect. Um, and I find the SDGs as a really effective framework um, and serves as a roadmap for students to explore these issues you know, in a global context. Um, so wanted to make the connection between the connection between global systems of education and the SDGs. So actually in SDG four, quality education, in target 4.7, it actually addresses global citizenship and um, uh, by ensuring that institutions are providing um, students and equipping students with the knowledge skills needed to promote sustainable development um, through education. Um, so uh, there's really, so the United Nations addresses that this is a need. Um, so I feel like um, I just wanted to make the connection between uh, how global citizenship and SDGs are connected. Um, next slide. So again, in target 4.7, it addresses um, the need for global citizenship education. Um, wanted to just spend a few minutes to talk about kind of what the benefits are and why I feel it's necessary. Um, so in target 4.7, um, it states that all young people, regardless of their background, um, deserve to be prepared for meaningful work in the global economy and to take part in solving the global challenges that impact their lives and communities. So the focus here, you know, is on equity and making sure that all of our, that all learners are being equipped with these skills and knowledge needed to really thrive in our global world. So here I wanted to share some um, examples of project-based learning um, to share with you some projects that I've engaged my students in. So during the pandemic in 2020, um, Roger Williams was trying to offer more um, online courses um, in particular to high school students um, during lockdown. So um, I was able to create a new course titled Thriving in a Global World, which specifically incorporated, you know, components of global citizenship and um, sustainable development goals. Um, so we titled the project Rhode Island Changemakers and students worked in teams and I gave them the freedom to select, you know, after studying the SDGs, they could choose which sustainable development goal um, was of most interest to them. And they had to uh, do research in identifying the problem um, and then uh, engage with the community to solicit feedback from the community about how they can best develop solutions to address some of these issues. So here is one project. Um, Anna Durfee was the project leader. Um, they chose to focus their project on SDG um, 11. Um, yeah, sustainable cities and communities. So they really focused on, so they reached out to a couple um, organizations that assisted the homeless population here in Rhode Island. And they said at that time, they really needed care packages. So the students put together care packages um, and distributed them to these organizations. Um, and really through this project, they were really addressing um, target 11.3 and you know, ensuring safe and affordable housing and getting at some of these root causes. So here's another project um, that students uh, uh, engaged in to address SDG 4 quality education. Um, again, they reached out to different community organizations and determined that there was a need, there was a lack of accessibility of school supplies for, for many students across Rhode Island. And this was impacting um, their ability to thrive in school. So they organized a donation drive um, to collect school supplies. They created an Instagram page, did a whole social media campaign. Um, and again, the emphasis on they, you know, outreach to the community to find to solicit feedback from the community about what the needs were and um, base their their research and actions on that. So um, check them out on their Instagram page. <laughs> They're actually, and I think that's the thing um, that I want to really reinforce. Um, you can go to the next slide, Sim. Um, is that um, you know projects like these can really promote lifelong um, engagement. So. On this slide, 
this is a tool that I wanted to share with you that I found to be effective in providing, you know, structure to these projects. So um, I use this logic model template. Um, Social Enterprise Greenhouse is actually a nonprofit here in Providence. Um, so this logic model template students use to uh, establish their goals and objectives for their projects. Um, so it really serves as a nice structure for them. And then they're able to identify, you know, those short and long-term outcomes and what their long-term, what the vision is for their long-term impact. Um, you know, I'm realistic with students in the fact that they may not see that long-term impact in one semester. Um, but the idea is that hopefully, like the two projects I just showed you, they're still continuing their efforts. And the idea is that these projects, while we only have one semester, hopefully will serve as a springboard for future projects and ongoing um, work in the community. So, and that's what I've seen among my students. Okay, and here are just, again, I think it's important to really show a student perspective and we're gonna hear from Sen in a minute. Um, Erica it was the one student who helped uh, facilitate the uh, school supply drive. So here's a testimonial from Erica and that's what I was trying to reinforce is um, this urge to respond and um, light these lifelong learning engagement. So uh, Erica um, is quoted saying, even after our Thrive in a Global World course, you know, she still stays engaged um, with the news around the world and is always really seeking volunteer opportunities in her own community. And I think that's um, one of the benefits of, you know, fostering global citizenship is that students um, then um, continue to be, you know, active citizens in their communities um, and emphasizing that, um, you know, they can be responsible global citizens um, creating impact from within their own community. They don't have to travel abroad, but they can really foster that impact um, from within their own community. Um, next slide. Okay. All right, so now, um, so as I mentioned, Sen with the Amani um, is a former student of mine. Um, as I mentioned, I was able to create this Thriving a Global World course um, in 2020. Um, I taught it uh, as a synchronous class with the students um, who engage in the projects that I just showed you. I also um, developed a um, asynchronous course um, in which Sen uh, participated in, in which um, Sen was able to take the course in, in different modules. Um, so Sen, um, I'll just share his testimonial and then introduce him. Um, Sen had uh, shared his reflection on the course and said that his key takeaway uh, was how to live a more meaningful way of existence on this planet Earth, thereby contributing even with small things um, that I could do to the society and community. And that's one thing that I really emphasize in um, courses where I integrate global citizenship education is with students reinforcing how their, their small actions really um, can have a global impact. And um, so... With that, I want to introduce um, Sen. Um, so he, like I said, is a former student of mine. He's going to share the projects that he completed in my course. Um, but he's actually now my colleague. He's a continuing education instructor at Roger Williams University. Um, so Sen, welcome. Thank you so much for being here to share your projects and um, take it away. Hey, Mary. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen and, and go to the project here. So this is the website I created uh, by taking the project of understanding the 17 goals. As I was a digital literacy instructor, uh, I was very much interested in selecting quality education for as my project work. So a little bit of tech technological information. This is a website that is developed using HTML, CSS, and a JavaScript. And you go here. So as I said, my focus is on quality education. In this, we have various target. As Mary explained, the target 4.7, I choose the target 4.3. So that is equal access to affordable technical, vocational, and higher education. So as I am a continuing education instructor, I deal mostly with the GED students and the technological related stuff. So I thought of taking 4.3 target and doing some sort of analysis on that and see how the global stands, the whole world, each nation stands in the achievement of 4.3 in 
aiding or supporting the UN goal of 2030. So we have various goals here. So this is 4.7. So, and this is just the JavaScript where it will create a generate a random code based on the education. So he is Ban Ki-moon, he is the eighth Secretary General of United Nations. So he says education promotes quality and lifts people of our poverty. It teaches children how to become good citizens. Education is not just for a privileged few, it is for everyone, it is a fundamental human right. So like that, we keep on generating random codes using JavaScript here. And this is the data analysis part, in particularly, for the quality education uh, for. We started the goal number four, but this project has took us to analyze all the 17 goals that I'm going to explain in a moment. So let's hover our mouse here and see various regions. So if we look at this particular nations called as OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So here we see that no poverty is 98.85%, which means almost the target is achieved. Whereas the consumption and production is 57.4. So what we noticed the difference between the developed countries versus the underdeveloping countries. And then let's get into Europe and Central Asia. No poverty is 92 and industry innovation and infrastructure is 39.16. And if we get into this one, Middle East and North Africa, no poverty is 94 and gender e equity is 44.65. And then climate action like this, we have the various analysis over various region. So let's straight away get into the data analytic part. So this is a software called as Tableau. Is anyone new to this? So this Tableau software helps us to get the data, the free public data that is available and do certain analysis and we can present that as a visual format. So the data that we used to do the quality education for goal is from the United Nations organization public data. We get, had the whole data until 2020. So how the project can be summarized into three category. So why we started this and how we did that and what for. So we, as Mary explained, the project is thriving, thriving in a global world. So why we started this project. So I mostly work with school dropped out students and we noticed that they drop out this for some personal reason and for family situation. And we also noticed that uh, limited uh, access in technology literacy skills and maybe no education or no continuous education due to the migration from other countries. And mostly we work with refugees in Rhode Island. So as we deal with a lot of them, particularly we faced a lot of challenge during the pandemic situation. So when the in-person classroom took over to virtual classroom and the work from home scenario started, we noticed a significant challenge. Some were able to cope up with the technology, able to attend the online class, some not able to cope up with the technology. So that what we understood, right? As I work mostly with adult education group or a community group, we noticed this difference, the difference between the digital immigrants versus the digital natives. So digital immigrants are the one who are new to technology. So the natives are the one who born or brought up during the growth of the technology. So we can see the cartoon here to the right that explains uh, dad asked uh, her daughter a question, how, hi sweetie, how was the school today? And her response was, you can read all about it on my blog dad. So this is the difference between the digital immigrants and the uh, natives. So we want to fill the gap between these two by providing quality education for the adult citizens. And we want to analyze where each nation stands in achieving this goal as target number 7.4. So let's go here. 
And then the project is the brief analysis of United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of 2030. And the objective that we took is for quality education SDG number four. But later this project took us to do the analysis on almost all the goals, which I'm going to explain in a moment. And the data format that we downloaded from United Nations ORG is the Excel format. So we just downloaded the Excel file and just we cleaned up the way in which we want. And then we use this in the Tableau software. So this is a global representation of the whole world with respect to the quality education data that we had from United Nations organization from 2010 to 2020. So if you see here, the goal achievement is green and the major challenges are in red. And we can also filter here and see the data over here. Let's go and filter for the goal achievement. And these are all the countries seems to be achieved as to the requirement of United Nations goal. And the major challenges remains for these nations still. And then significant challenge remains for these nations. Let's move on to the next slide. So this is again the same representation with some data points with graphical visualization. So the target is 4.3 and equal access to affordable and te technical vocational and higher education, each nation's where every nation stands. And here we have the top five country score. The Sweden tops as of 2020 to the top list, 84.72 and then Germany. So we have the top five score here. If you are interested in getting to know about a particular nation, we can pull this down arrow and then we can go for the particular country. Let's say that I'm interested to look for Algeria. Let's go here. And then here we can also look for a certain animation. We can do the animation effect here. So we can see from here, the education target 4.3 attained by Algeria from 2010 to 2020 is from 58.28 to almost they achieved the education level. So like this, we can analyze for each and every nation. So again, this is the complete picture of the education attainment. And again, only for the target 4.3. So we can hover our mouse over and we can see the year-wise progress So until that slide was the, our focus for quality education, then we thought, okay, let's do the analysis for all of the 17 goals. And we downloaded the remaining data for each goals and started to analyze. And here again, we have the region-wise data here. So here it is uh, the OECD regions. And we can see here the regional score for OECD nation is 77.30. And then if we just go here for Africa, we can notice the regional score is 53.13. So in our data analysis, what we noticed, the developed countries are, if I hover my mouse, you can change the changes at the bottom. Here you can see the 17 goals with their respective scores. For the OECD nation, the no poverty is 98.85 and then Global goal three is good health and well-being is 91.28, as well as quality education is 98. Here you can see almost everything seems to be achieved. Whereas when you go for the lowest score, we can see the responsible consumption and protection needs to be achieved. And then here we can see the climate action. So not a responsible climate action here and the life below water. So this seems to be a low score, whereas here education and poverty seems to be achieved. Whereas when you look the same data for the country Africa, here we can notice that looks like the climate action as well as the responsible consumption production is met as per the UN requirement. Whereas they are still facing the challenge in no poverty, zero hunger and good health and well-being and quality education. So the same uh, 
pictorial representation. So if I hover my mouse, you can see to the right hand side, the respective regional score. This is the Middle East. And then if you go here, you can see the picture of Africa. Let's go to the next slide. So the same information with the respective logo here. So let's go to the top five countries here. Sweden, as of 2020, it, it, it ranks at the top as per the UN score. We can see here, no poverty, good health and well-being, and then quality education seems to be almost 100. Whereas when it comes to the responsible consumption production, climate action, if below water is in still question. So let's go to the bottom countries and uh, check with few, maybe Somalia, if you see here, you can see here, the climate action and responsible consumption is almost met the requirement of United Nations. Whereas it comes to the poverty, zero hunger, and then good health and well-being, these are still in question. And then furthermore, we can go for the respective country and we can get to know the details. So this is the two data, uh, two slides that we have for the all the 17 goals. And then, so what, why we did all this analysis and for what? So the global idea, as I already mentioned, I'm mainly working with the adult education community. The idea is they want, want the idea is to bring them to more into the digital citizens, getting technology to them. As a global citizen, we make more digital citizens by offering quality education. Together, we make happy digital citizens. So this project, as I mentioned, uses the public uh, Tableau software and the flat file system from download from United Nation organization as an Excel file format. And the future enhancement will be the live web data connector that we are thinking about. And now as I'm teaching uh, the digital literacy skills for, for the students, uh, my pro idea is to give the uh, student the option to select any one of the goals that they are interested in and get the data from the United Nations organization and do the sort of analysis and present like this and uh, see some insights about where each nations or the nation that they are interested in. So we'll get the questions later. So before that, uh, let me get into this. All right, so here, so whatever I discussed so far, let's review that in a two minutes video. Yes, the credit for this project goes to Roger University and for the thriving in global world education provided by Mary uh, for her excellent instructional design and making it for the online uh, education system. And as a part of this project, uh, we also asked to engage with the NGOs that work that works for the uh, 
uh, global goals. And I, I associated with We Make Change uh, ORG as a research manager. And this is a website here, and they have various projects. And uh, each project uh, have, have chosen uh, unique global goals, and they are working on that. So they're looking for volunteers to work with them. And then to develop the web page and to create the data visualization part, I, I used the Providence Public Library help. And then this is the data, public data that we can download and do the analysis. Yeah, thank you so much. Let me go to the. Yes, Mary. Sen, thank you so much um, for sharing your innovative project. Um, really appreciate you sharing that with us. You know, I really wanted to highlight projects um, from students to show. Um, how global citizenship frameworks can really be an effective framework um, across disciplines. So I think that's one thing to really point out is that global citizenship education can really be applied across disciplines and it can really be an effective framework for learners of all ages, as we can see with, with the projects that we've highlighted today. Um, a couple of things I also want to mention in terms of other strategies that I use um, to facilitate global citizenship education. Um, one methodology that I found to be really effective is using um, action research um, in the projects um, that I engage students in um, so that there's really an emphasis on community involvement um, in developing the project ideas. Um, I also take send knows, I also take a strengths-based approach um, in having uh, students uh, take either the Clifton Strengths Assessment or the VIA uh, Character um, Survey uh, so that students can understand um, their natural talents and apply those um, to the projects that they're engaging in to really apply their strengths and passions to make the change that they want um, in the projects that, that they engage in in my courses. So those are a couple other strategies that, that I use as well. Um, so we have some resources for you um, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Um, Asia Society, um, I mentioned, is, has some great resources. Like I said, they were instrumental in building the movement um, around uh, global competence. Um, Oxfam International has some great um, resources for their global citizenship framework. Um, the Global Goals um, is a great uh, website because they have um, each goal on their website and you can click on it and then that gives you all the individual targets. Um, we Make Change, Sen just uh, showed you uh, their webpage. He had partnered with them. That's a great resource because um, they have existing projects um, addressing global issues that you can actually collaborate with them on. So really great resource um, to collaborate on existing projects. And then World Savvy, um, again, has some additional global citizenship uh, education frameworks um, and has some really great, great resources. So thank you so much. We would love to um, take some questions. Um, Sen, do you see any questions in the chat or? Um, there is point? one question in the Q&A. So um, Jeff Chamberlain has asked, um, he has some students that do collaborative problem solving on the SDGs, uh, but his problem is that they don't follow up on their good proposals. So he's asking for any recommendations to help incentivize the students. Interesting, yeah. So, um, I, yeah. Um, so I, what I, so the project that I highlighted was during the pandemic. So it was an online course, um, which makes it more challenging <laughs> to be involved when I'm, um, so now, you know, I'm back on campus, I'm teaching in person now. When I'm teaching face to face, it's easier to be a little more involved in the projects. What I, what I try to do in terms of ensuring that students follow up is be more, you know, uh, involved in the community partnership. So, not to micromanage, but um, definitely I try to play a role in uh, facilitating uh, the community partnership. So, um, I'll because I. 
um, to help students, you know, follow up on their communication, follow up on you know, their action plan. Um, so I do try, um, you know, sometimes that's extra work on the instructor's part, but for me, you know, it's really important to maintain those community relationships. Um, so I, you know, try to help be a part of that communication to make sure that students are following up. So that's one strategy that I found to be effective is just being, um, you know, just having students include me on the email so I can, so I'll know, you know, when it's time to follow up. Um, so just being uh, a part of um, the communication, being um, a part of the, the relationship. So I hope that helps. Uh, if folks have other questions, feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I did think that there was one thing that you were talking about that I found really interesting was that you've done this in both a, a, a live class and an asynchronous class. What are the, the pluses and minuses, the challenges of that? Because I we do, we have a lot of folks who are interested in that piece of it because we all had to go online and they weren't really sure how to do the community engagement piece. And that's a great question. And it, and it was challenging, of course, but and maybe Sen could speak to his experience um, taking it asynchronous. But I think what I found is, I mean, it's it's challenging because you're, you know, you're limited. Well, g g going back to the question that was just asked, you're not, you know, when you're not seeing the students, you don't know if they're following up. And um, so I think um, one of the benefits is of teaching, uh, you know, synchronous or in person is that you have more face to face time. But I think I'll be honest with the projects that I shared that was um, it was online, but it was synchronous. We were meeting at a certain time, um, but it was online. And honestly, I think um, because it was during the pandemic, students really had that you know eagerness to really get out and, and outreach, and so they you know we didn't have any issues um, following up. And I think because they were working in teams, I think that made a difference because they all took on a certain role in their group, and um, I kind of guided them on you know what roles they could each kind of take on to make sure that the project goals were being accomplished. So um, typically one student would kind of be designated as the person who would you know, lead the communication with the community partner. So I think it can help to ensure that, um, you know, keep, you know, checking regularly with project teams and ensure that um, everybody um, in the team has a role so that the work isn't falling out on one person. So I think that that structure really helped. And I think because it was during the pandemic, students really um, were eager to, um, you know, outreach and, um, you know, follow up. So, um, but I don't know, Sen, do you want to speak to your experience, you know, take, because you took it um, asynchronous. So you did it, you, know, you did, the, we met once in a while, but you were doing the work uh, independently. So I don't know if you want to speak to how your experience was. Yeah, that, that's right. The online class, when it comes to a synchronous model and versus synchronous model, it again depends uh, on, uh, it has both has its own pros and cons. Uh, if I want to talk about the online class that the instructional design that uh, we are facilitating, right? So the students have the opportunity to work on their own pace. So they don't have to rush for the syllabus. So they have their uh, time phased and they have the opportunity to meet with the peers and the excellent if they have if they have a good learning management system so they interact with among among the peers right they share the things they have the materials on their own so this would see as the uh, pro part of the uh, online or virtual learning thank you so if if there's faculty or staff on this call that are interested in sort of implementing something like this what would you think sort of the first next step would be um, i know that someone put something in let's put in another yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think the first step would be you know determining you know what method method i mean because there's certainly other you know i do a lot of service learning too um which is similar to project-based learning, but it's more, um, more, you know, more intentional, more of a reciprocal relationship with the community partner. Um, service learning is a great pedagogy to facilitate global citizenship education. Um, but I think determining, you know, what pedagogy you're going to use, I think um, determining, you know, what methodology, like I said, I've used um, action research, which has been really effective. Um, so I think just developing your project, your methodology, 
um, you know, if you're going to have, you know, students work in teams, are you going to assign them? Um, what I found what to be effective is for students to pick which global issues they that are most important to them. Um, and then they're going to be more apt to be really engaged in the work when they're selecting issues that um, there are that are most important to them. So I think giving students the freedom to do that has been has worked for me. Um, but I think if you are going to have that reciprocal relationship with the community partner, having that, you know, in place, um, you know, before you start the project so that you have a community partner on board um, who is you know, willing to work with you and, and set some expectations with the community partner. Um, so I think those are some things you'd want to have um, in place before you engage in a project like this. I think the other important piece is, um, and again, you know, global education could be integrated across disciplines, but making sure that, you know, the project ties in with the learning outcomes of your course. I think that's really, really, really key um, in embedding that in the language of your syllabus. So um, I know at Roger Williams, we have um, certain courses that are designated community engagement courses. So students know when they sign up that they're going to be, it's not, you know, a traditional lecturing course, but they're going to actually be engaged in a project and interfacing with the community. So I think that's another, um, if you can uh, put that in place at your institution, having um, designated, you know, community engagement courses, um, then students know up front when they're signing up that that's how the course is designed. Then you, then students go into it, you know, um, expecting it and hopefully are, are really excited. So that's another um, uh, process I recommend, you know, if you can having designated courses. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Sen, now that you are an instructor as well, are you integrating some of this into how you're teaching as well? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, are, we are having the class called Data Navigators. So students at the end of the class, what they understood by learning the software called Tableau, they have to do a kind of project work. So we are encouraging them uh, with the global citizenship, giving these 17 goal ideas. Some are interested in, in doing the analysis and finding the insights about no poverty or someone interested in climate action. So they took their own project. So they look for the data where to download and they work on how to clean the data and how to visualize that, how to present that online. So they, yeah, they can take the data based on the country-wise or they can expand that to, to a higher level like that. It's nice yeah. to see it come full circle from student to instructor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I know we have, so in the chat, um, I mean, Natasha said that, um, Natasha currently teaches a synchronous, is it okay if I just read in the chat? Um, online class with a community service learning project with an environmental organization. Um, and they meet with the organization virtually, um, but yeah, it's not the same type of engagement, um, but that there's a requirement to do a one-time in-person gathering um, and hope that the interaction would get students more excited. Yeah, it's tough, you know, online. I mean, <laughs> um, it really is. Um, and it, it's not the same, you know, like Natasha is saying, um, but I love Natasha, your idea to have a requirement. And that's what I do with my, with my online courses. Um, Cause I do, I'm teaching one this semester that's online but it's a community engagement course. So I just, in this, even though it's, it's asynchronous I do require that we meet, we can't meet in person but we meet at least virtually once or twice a semester so that we can meet virtually with the community partner. And I find that um, that has really worked well. The students actually like that we actually get together at least once or twice a semester. And I think it's important. I think the important part is that whether it's in person or virtual, there's somehow there's communication with the community partner. So I think that definitely needs to happen um, for the project to be successful. So that's great that you're trying that out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not the same virtually, but it can be done. <laughs> so have to get uh, creative, but um, yeah, the service learning goals. Yeah, um, definitely a key component is is being intentional about um, connecting your learning objectives and your syllabus to the project. That that's key, so that students understand, um, you know, how the project ties into you know what they're what they're learning. Um, absolutely, is key. Um, and, you know, I, I have so many, I, I do a lot of work in service learning, so a lot of resources specific to service learning if, if um, 
our contact information is on the last slide. So feel free to contact, um, you know, reach out after this because I have so many other resources to share if people are interested in specifically in service learning. Um, so. Great. Well, if I, if, this, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put those in the chat or raise your hand and I can allow you to speak. Um, otherwise, I can. I, I read a quote recently that said, if you can be anyone in the world, be someone who ends meetings early. <laughs> I, I, I saw that, yes. <laughs> so I feel like this is the kind of thing where you just, it's people love to get some time back in their day just to refresh. Uh, thank you both so much. I think this was really informative. Um, as, a, as you notice, this is being recorded, so it will be up on our website and we will send an email to everyone who participated or who signed up to participate. Um, just a couple of small reminders. We do have two more uh, webinars in the National Webinar Series. So one is March 24th and the other is April 7th. So please go online and sign up for those. We also have our national conference coming up. So that is also virtual and that's March 29th through 31st. I think it's gonna be a really fantastic event. Uh, Dr. Patina Love is our keynote speaker. Um, and we always have lots of new and exciting things happening. So please be on our website and on our newsletter. And if you have any questions or concerns, always feel free to reach out. So thank you everyone for being here. And I really appreciate your participation.